Hi guys, welcome back to the MS Guide. I am joined by Natalie Busari, and Natalie has a heck of a story to tell. So today we're mostly going to cover barriers. As you can probably notice by now, we look slightly different. So we have different takes on having MS in the UK. And I'm really, really keen to learn from Natalie the sort of challenges that she's faced. I didn't know many people, any any black person who had MS. To be How she's gone about dealing with them. And hopefully you can take away something for yourself from this too. Hey Natalie, how are you doing? Yeah, not too bad, not too bad. You've got an extraordinary journey. I was reading about you. I mean, these days it's called stalking. In the old days it's research. But, um, <laughs> you know, and you remind me in many ways of my friend Rachel, who we followed her stem cell journey on the channel. You know, you got diagnosed really quite aggressively unpleasant MS and mm -hmm. tried some fairly heavy DMTs and none of them worked. It. And then what happened? Um, at that point, I was just kind of like, well, they're clearly not working. And so I'd rather just, I just wanted them to leave me alone and just let me deal with the MS myself. If I'm going down with it, I'm going down. I don't care. But um, I have a really supportive um, neurologist um, she was saying to me that, you know, have you heard of the stem cell transplant? Okay. And I did kind of hear about it, but I didn't know too much of it because I do have a friend um, who has MS and she was about to um, undergo the um, stem cell transplant. But in the end, it didn't go forward. But I didn't ask too much about it. Yeah. I just knew that it seemed like it was quite tough. So when my neurologist was explaining to me all about the procedure and stuff, I, I don't think I was listening too much because I just at that point, you know, I was I was already angry because um, I was relapsing and um, the MS was attacking my right side like it always does. And um, I'm right handed and I'm a web designer, so I need my <laughs> I need my right hand. It got really it to be honest, it really frustrated me. And so I, I think I was at a point where I was just giving up. So when she mentioned the stem cell transfer, she had to say it a few times to me and I wasn't really listening. And then I had. Um, a horrible relapse. I think it was February 2020. Just before we went into lockdown, the month before we went into lockdown, I had a massive relapse and I just remember how awful the pain was. But this time it hit me in my left calf and it's never ever hit me on my left side. So I didn't know, I was just, I was actually, it was weird because I was staying at my mom's house at, with the kids and um, I literally just woke up with this horrible pain. And if I was to describe it, I would say it's something like someone was opening your leg, <laughs> opening your leg and just ripping everything out of it. It was just so painful. And I didn't want to wake the kids up. And my mom came running out of her room where the kids were. And she was like, oh, what's going on? What's wrong? And I was just, I just was in so much pain. And my sister was like, oh, she was complaining about her leg. She, I don't know, she just all of a sudden started screaming. I just literally screamed the place down. So I put my face on the pillow. So I didn't want to wake up the kids. So I was just screaming in this pillow. So my sister was just like, mom, I think we need to call the ambulance. Um, this is becoming too much. So they called the ambulance and they came and um, they started asking a few questions. I couldn't really answer them because I was just in so much pain. And mom was trying to explain to them that I have MS and everything like that. And they're asking about my medication and stuff like that. So if they were going to give me anything, yeah. you know, so they said, okay, let's um, let us examine you a bit further um, in the ambulance van. So we had to slowly take me down the stairs. I was trying my best not to scream, but one of the paramedics moved my leg a bit quickly before I had the chance to, and I just let out this loud scream. By this time we were outside my mom's house. So it was about, I think it was like 5 a.m. in the morning and I could just hear all the windows open because all the neighbors want to see what's going on because all my the screen curtains was, twitching like this yeah it was awful I could the scream was so loud so I was crying at this point all the way to the hospital um they gave me like I think some liquid morphine and I just did, did, did fell it do anything <laughs> sorry did it do anything the morphine um I think so because I, I fell asleep <laughs> <laughs> it got me to sleep so I think maybe I don't know because when I woke up I didn't I, I could still feel like the pain was there, but it wasn't as bad as it was. So it was doing definitely doing something. Hey, but Nat, um, Nat, 
I don't, I just woke up to my sister telling me that, you know, you've got to take it easy. Cause apparently I was really horrible to the, the nurses and the doctors. And I have no recollection of this, but my sister said I was in so much pain. I was swearing, I was being rude up until the point where I fell asleep. So uh, when then they came, I kind of like apologized. I didn't realize, um, you know, I was um, being that mean or <laughs> whatever. So they did all the blood Actually, tests. You know how... let, me, let me interrupt Sorry. you. And it's like, we're extraordinary creatures, aren't we? You're in huge amount of pain, but mm. you don't want to wake up the kids. Yeah. It's not that you're embarrassed or anything. It's that you don't mm. want to disrupt them and then have them going, what's wrong with mummy and all this kind yeah. of stuff. And as soon as you have yeah. kids, you will do the most extraordinary things. Yeah, just to protect them and stuff. Yeah, you yeah. do. So um, I was about to leave the hospital and, you know, I was getting off the bed and all of a sudden I fell on the floor. And I was like, well, it's, it's like it was a weird moment. So I just I tried to get myself up, but I could get my arms up onto the, the bed, but my legs, I couldn't feel them all of a sudden. And I was like, OK. OK, that is weird. So my sister's like, well, what's going on? It's like, I can't feel my legs. So she's like, what do you mean you can't feel? She was just like a bit shocked. It's like, what do you mean you can't feel your legs? I literally, I cannot feel my legs. I mean, they're, they're there, but I can't. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I can, I can so see she, them. So but... she was just like, OK, I'm, I said, I'm calling the doctor. So the doctor came back. So I was telling her all about it. And um, so she started doing some pin tests, trying to prick and stuff like that. I couldn't feel, I don't know, it was weird. I, I just couldn't feel my legs. And then she said, um, it was weird because I kind of felt something heavy, but it's like it wouldn't move when I, I wanted it to move. So she said, OK, um, have um, uh, take the crutches and see how you do with that. So I was taking the crutches and I, you know, I tried to move one leg forward and it just wouldn't move. So the doctor was like, OK, if you can't move your legs, then I can't discharge you. And that's what frustrated me so much, because all I wanted to do was just get home to my children. So at this point, I was just like. You know, I shouldn't have to think about moving my legs. If you if you want to move, you just move. It's just like a reaction that happens. You don't have to think about it. And it was so frustrating that, you know, you, I kept never I, had that with your MS before. You'd never had any of this yeah. sort of mm. lack of. Yeah, I mean, it, I mean, what you describe it is just everybody's MS is different, isn't it? But yeah, it's, yeah, just, you know, there's it's, lovely new things happening. You think, what the hell's going on? Yeah, I'm just, I think I, I at that point I was getting really, I, I could just see the frustration coming and um, yeah, I think I, I do remember being rude at that point at that, because she was just like, look, you know, there's, just stay, let's, I'm going to admit you. It's like, just give me, I was getting very frustrated, like, just give me one more chance. I just want to try again. So she gave me another chance with the crutches and I remember my legs weren't moving. I got so angry and I literally just threw it at her. And I just started crying and I just, I just, cause I just wanted to go home. I didn't know what was going on. I don't, I, I think at that point, it wasn't the fact that I, I didn't think that the main worry should be that my legs, I can't feel them. My main worry is that I just want to get home and be with my kids. I, I didn't even think, cause most people would be like, oh my God, my legs, I can't move them. But that wasn't my main worry at the time until after they had admitted me and I had just taken everything in. Now you're a so mum. That's the thing, was, you're a mum. <laughs> I just want my kids to be honest it was awful to be honest I, I I just can never forget that time so that's when they had to call the neurologist and my neurologist came in that's when she brought up the conversation again she goes look Natalie I know you weren't too keen about this before but can you just please just try to think about it so um she told me all about the procedure what goes into it and stuff like that at that point where I was like is it really worth going through all of that because it's a lot to I, go through I, all I, of that I, I and no guarantees feeling. that it'll even work just to go through all of that I was just I couldn't really be bothered my mom was like no if you're not going to I'm I'm going to call your neurologist now and I'm going to tell her that you're having it I really hope that this stem cell treatment will help Natalie so that I'll get my daughter back it's risky, but I, I always think, you know, anything's risky. Crossing the road is risky. People don't understand how to compare risk generally, you know. it's um, yeah. But the fact is, you're talking about the rest of your life. I mean, you sound to me like you had this amazing neurologist, regardless yeah. of everything. But mm. elsewhere, did you run into things that you would think to yourself, I'll bet an old white guy wouldn't have this problem? Mm. I don't know. I think when you when you're exposed to the support that I had, I wouldn't. Um, I didn't even think of it. To be honest, I didn't even know um, 
I didn't know many people, any any black person who had MS, to be honest. Right. So I kind of felt alone with that. And I remember I did um, say one time that when um, I had I got rushed into hospital, um, had breathing issues, and um, the doctor in the A and E, when he read my notes, uh, he was an, he was like an old white man, but he was kind of like, oh, I was such a shame that you've got um, MS because black people are supposed to have sickle cell, not MS. Oh, There's only oh, white great. people. I... So that's what he was saying. So it goes also, you know, you're really unlucky. You're really unlucky for having that. I was just like, okay, I don't know. Like I was looking at him because I wasn't sure if he was serious. It's just like a doctor really is like talking like that. But, you know, I just kind of smiled at him and I just, yeah. maybe I just thought it was old age or something. <laughs> I, kind of, I just thought like, I know that when you already know the facts yourself, it's just like, there's no point. I wasn't going to get into an argument. No. He just, it's funny because he kind of said it in a friendly way. It wasn't kind I, of obnoxious patronizing. He was really, he's like a really friendly guy. So I just went with it, to be honest. Do, do you know my view? And most people, out, most people out there don't want to hurt our feelings. Especially, you know, take, forget skin color or, or gender or anything like that with MS. The fact that when somebody else knows you have MS and they don't, that puts a burden on them. And I don't mean that we put it on them. It's just all of a sudden they think, I want to do and say the right thing. You know, mm. And they're looking at you and you're not part of the world that they inhabit. And so they're trying to think, how do I frame this? Crikey. So, Natalie, I, from what I understand, a lot of your challenges came within, should we say, your community or family. Yeah. Yeah. Something which I, I would have no idea about. I mean, what was what was the biggest thing you noticed when you said, I have a disability MS? Well, um, my mom. I, I knew that my mum was taking it a bit hard mm -hmm. because um, cause, uh, we grew up in a single parent household. My dad lives in Ghana right. um, and um, my mum always raised us by herself. So it's just like when there was always something wrong, like if we're at school and the teachers are putting us in a lower group, then we should be in a, the above group or the teachers are not being nice to us or a neighbor or neighbor's child is not my mom's always the one to protect us so it was hard for her like this time she couldn't protect me she couldn't fix this and I could see that that was that was what was breaking her in a way because she's always no matter how old me and my sister are just me and my older sister you know were always her babies and to her it was hard like she couldn't protect us and I think what was difficult for my mom is that um my sister um was diagnosed with lupus um oh, a year close. yeah a year before i was diagnosed with ms so um <laughs> with her she was just like you know why me, done? you know what, why what, my what? children like something is wrong here she you know she was always thought it was is it supernatural africans will think it's either supernatural someone is jealous and they've done this kind of thing so it was just kind of like my mom she she kind of um eventually started to understand it a bit and understand why I needed to talk about it but it was the aunties and uncles like I grew up with were the ones that were so difficult about it they didn't want me to talk about it they just told you me your mum did they not like your mum talking about it or did they not like it was your job Natalie to get back in your box and not mention this um well my mum didn't my mum didn't um talk about it with them Right. It was always me, like when I was talking about it, because there are times where I wouldn't feel great. And I know it's MS and um, they'll ask me, OK, what's wrong? And I would say what it is. And they don't want to hear that it's MS. Like, oh, have you prayed about it? Go to your room, pray about it. They don't want to hear it. It's like a weakness. And some of them till this day haven't spoken to me since. Wow. Like, yeah, since it's I because came Because you out, spoke up about... because you said, yeah, this is MS and this yeah. makes me feel Tired. It was the fact yeah. that I went and told everyone. I went the the if you uh, I mean I went on social media um, and just told everyone that I had MS. I I went on my WhatsApp. I said it there. I have MS. I described it. I talk about it. So everyone knows I have it, and they just hated it, and they didn't want to talk about it. So till this day, they're not speaking to me. This what if you were going to essentially speak through this to a person of African origin? in the mm. uk what what would you say to them to make their life easier with ms well i would definitely tell them 
um, just reach out to the community because um, there's no, there's nothing like the MS community, to be honest. There's always someone there who understands what you're going through. Reach out. You know, you're not alone. There's so many of us there, you know. Um, and uh, you know what else? Can... It's not considered right or good or whatever to talk about it. Mm. I think that that means it's overlooked. I mean, Ben Adams, Dr. Ben Adams is doing that study at Bart's called the Adams yeah. study, you know, to look at the... Um, the genetic stuff in and he's mm. recruiting again i'll put that in the comments but you know recruiting people of uh african and asian origin yeah to help because ms is is you'd think it was a white man's disease mm. you know or a white woman's disease frankly because there's more women than men but we are starting to learn that it's not and i think part of that like you say is that whole don't talk about it yeah don't mention it we've got enough to deal with you know or whatever or pray i mean Religion's a very strong influence, isn't it? Yeah, it is. Yeah. yeah. Not always for the best, I think. No. There's some people who do manipulate it. I think it's just religion is meant to be kind of like, you know, with me, it's like it's my relationship with God that matters. How I pray, religion is more of the culture. Because you know that if you're Muslim, you know, you go to the mosque with other fellow Muslims and you pray, you do, you know, there's certain rituals that you do within your community in your religion but there's still that cultural aspect that comes into play as well so uh, with me that's why I don't take it too much like yeah I'm a Catholic but it, I'm a practicing Catholic I do go to church quite regularly but the main thing for me is my relationship with God um, some African and I think some African churches they'll say I don't know you know pay this amount of money we'll do a prayer for you and stuff like that I don't need that I can I don't need someone to pray on my behalf to God. I've got my own relationship with God. That's how I see it. I think so, that's confusing religion. Yeah. I think what you do is up to you in your business so that makes sense. But essentially it's using a fear of something to yeah. extract money. That's your main advice is reach out back into the community. And I'd yeah. echo that. I don't care who you are, what gender, what colour. You're right. It's an amazing MS community, whether it's on Instagram or whether it's on Twitter or whether yeah. it's on YouTube or whatever. I've recently opened um, a CIC. It's actually called the nerve of my multiple sclerosis. I've Excellent. kind of let the MS a bit longer. Now and a it's CIC more, is a community kind of, interest company. Exactly. So I'm kind of just kind of, um, it's for everybody to come and you know learn and stuff, but it's mainly targeted at the black community. Because yeah. what I do find like in terms of, medical research and field studies, anything related to black people with MS, there's a lack of it. But at the same time, um, I'm always talking about advocating representation in the black community. So one of the things is black people, there's two things that I'm trying to tackle. Black people don't really like talking about illnesses because mm. of things to do with our culture. Yeah. So I want to tackle that and then at the same time, I want us to also advocate because how can we advocate if we don't like talking about it? Because even if let's say there was more research out there for us to take part in, if we don't get over the, oh, I don't want to talk about it. I don't want to go and do all that stuff. Then how can we, we know what's going on? I mean, most of these medicines and stuff for MS were based on a white biology. So we don't really know how they all will affect us. So if we're doing like you're saying with the Adam study and other research out there, we need to know what other research is there out there for us, mm -hmm. or maybe even raise money to you know, start um, looking into more research for us. I can tell you one thing I've heard. Um, it's a frustration. Everybody gets so sort of nervous and dances around things, but mm -hmm. there is a, I would say what I perceive is a genuine frustration of it's there's an understanding and appreciation, like you say, that the drugs haven't been tested in people of, of black ancestry or Asian ancestry, yet to try and get them to come forward, because all of a sudden it, it can often be perceived as integrating with white people, and it's not about that, you know, really. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the people I know don't view it like that, but it's just, it's really tricky when you're white to try and reach out and say, we want to include you, we want to help you, because it always seems to come freighted with a degree of suspicion and things like this. And um, mm -hmm. I think what you're doing is excellent because, you know, it's just, there's no amount of me or any other white person talking about it, you know? So it's the fact that you do is amazing. So, <laughs> Natalie, thanks re very much for taking the time to come on today, this morning. 
Um, I don't know who's more tired, you or me, but we've both got MS. <laughs> so we both just push through. I'm going to go have a lie down. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.